Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm bringing something really special to you guys. This is, I don't even want to call it a video, it's more like a project, which I've been working on since around Feb or March this year. If you guys follow me on Insta, then you already know that this has been coming. Essentially, the thought process behind this is I wanted to do something special to commemorate Mental Health Awareness Week this year because collectively we've all been let's be honest we've been what's felt like to hell and back and I felt like we needed to do something special there is only so much help that I can be with what I say and what I talk about here because I draw off of my own experiences my own thought processes my own opinions and there is a limit as to how much help that can be to you guys so that's why I wanted to get more people involved in this so that you have a greater group of people to draw from and learn from um, and listen to and hopefully feel comforted and guided by. I've never done something like this before and I am beyond excited to share it with you. We've got so many people sharing their stories, sharing their experiences, sharing their pains, sharing their struggles with you today. I hope that this gives you a sense of support and the fact that there is a community beyond what you might know of people who are supporting you, encouraging you and just spreading their love to you. Ultimately, I hope that this brings you comfort and I hope that it might give you that extra push to reach out to someone if that's something that you've struggled with up until this point. So before I get into it, I just want to quickly put out a little trigger warning. There are topics being discussed which involve suicide, depression, anxiety, physical violence and I just want to put it out there that if you feel like anything like this could trigger you then please refrain from watching. Um, I will also try and put some timestamps in the description to give you a bit of an indication as to when particular triggers may arise so that you can watch certain sections as you wish but just please keep that in mind. There are some sensitive topics being discussed and ultimately just make sure that you are okay to listen and to watch. I'm not gonna talk too much because we have so many people who have a lot to say. So I really hope that you enjoy this. This is a little piece of my heart and I really, really hope you love it. what a question and it's the first one i've always been aware of mental health but then that awareness was intensified when i started going through my own mental health journey somebody could be like oh i'm feeling sad and depressed and especially young people you know like i'm like what you gotta be depressed about you're young you know but then it's only until i started going through my mental health journey that I was like whoa you know so now it's different if somebody actually opens up to me and says they're having a difficult time like you know I I'm I'm ready to listen and I'm there what made you start becoming more aware of mental health um it wasn't really taught about in schools um I don't remember anything about mental health in schools so I, so I think for me it was when I started to make friends with people who had mental health problems. I had a friend actually who is the first person I ever knew to go to therapy. And um, I think that really opened my eyes to the fact that young people have mental health problems. I think we were like 16 at the time. And that, um, you know, I was very blessed to have not experienced those problems myself. So I think that was when I became aware of it. I think people, my my age and our age and really know about it is f from living it or then learning about it online there was a time where i was stressed and it was like in my mid-20s and i i noticed that the stress wasn't going away and it had been a few days and i was starting to get worried i was like there's there's like a physical feeling in my head that i can't shake off and normally you'd you'd get rid of that when you sleep or when you eat or you know, when your mood changes, but I could not shift. It was like having a migraine in the middle of my head. I can't explain it. It's, I've never had it before and I've never had it again since, touch wood. Uh, and literally, 
I would not wish it upon anyone and I believe that is what mental health is. It's when you can't shake off a feeling no matter how positive you try to be, how much you try to you know, shift your energy and focus elsewhere. It's just a horrible thing. And um, since then I've just been a lot more cautious to the things I do to myself and the thoughts I think about and the way I make myself feel, but also the way I project energy and emotions onto other people as well. So what made me more aware of my mental health would definitely have to come down to the pandemic. Um, it was a place where uh, everything slowed down and I had no choice but to pay attention to my mental health because I was just in a terrible place and I wasn't the same person I was. So I think having all the time in the world uh, really just opened up a door for all the thoughts that come rushing into my head. Everything that was I was brushing off and distracting myself with work, friends, going out, filming, whatever it was, anything that I used to distract myself with all stopped so I completely came to a standstill and was just locked in the house and really found myself in, in a bad place. So I guess mental health as a concept hasn't always been super obvious to me. I always looked at it as being cognizant of other people's feelings but I never really understood what it meant to fully take care of my own mental health. You know I think with being kind of the oldest daughter of an Indian family especially you are innately trying to always take care of someone else and when I learned that my mental health needs to be secure before I go ahead and take care of someone else my life completely changed and I guess that switch happened for me when I finished college um, I was in a very toxic situation where I was consistently comparing myself you know there's a lot of gossip culture within the brown community at my school and I was caught in the middle of all of that and I kept getting you know, I guess you could say bullied. And I never really understood my self-worth until I left that situation. So once I did, I became a lot more cognizant about mental health and started speaking about it publicly because that was really the only thing that I knew how to do. I didn't want anyone to go through what I had gone through. So yeah, I think once I stepped out of a toxic situation, that's when I realized that my mental health matters too. I suppose like most people, it was experiencing death and having an experience of it and losing someone and people close to me either through taking their own lives or from just them losing their life uh, it gave me a great concept of what life is and um, i guess it it proved to me that as much as we are living day to day and we feel like you know we know where we're going and whatever else things can change it in, in any instant and it's not it's not forever yeah death was something that enabled me to understand how life actually works. On that journey of trying to figure out and discover what life is and what it means, I started to look for answers. <clears throat> and I went to, at the time, you know, 10 years ago or so, I went to the place where there was a lot of information, which was books. So I've got some books here that I've read. Uh, the Alchemist is one, let me see if that's actually in. The Alchemist is one which a lot of people have read and actually I read this way before I sort of started that journey as such there are, there are some good messages in this so the alchemist I've actually probably bought about 20 times no word of a lie and just given to people friends and family uh, because it, it was a book that it was one of the first books I actually read of my own accord yeah it was really it was really deep and I found you know it took me ages to read it and it's not even that thick but I just wasn't used to sitting reading books so um, I've just bought it and given it to people and hope that they had a similar not the same, but their own version of an experience with the book, not in any particular order. Um, the Power of Now was a good book for me to read. However, I read this second, it's by Eckhart Tolle, I think his name is, but I read that second to this book, which really was the one, A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose, which was a great book. It sounds like it's very self-helpy, but it's not. It was actually, it explores more stuff about the brain and about how that works and why it works and the functions and stuff that we go through which we don't even realise. I would say that I first understood mental health when I made the connection to my own life. Looking back now, I can say that it's something that I struggled with so much growing up because I couldn't find the words to describe it since like the age of about five. To me, it was just the way that I lived my life, being that young and battling with your mind is a lonely 
scary experience and it took so many years for me to finally be able to label it and speak about it and understand it. It's strange because so many of my experiences and memories, should I say, from when I was a child are predominantly about the battle I was having with my mind. And it's crazy because I look back now and they are some of the most vivid memories that I have. I remember one day, actually, my dad had picked me up from school and we were sitting in the car, parked up. And I remember it was a point where my mind just felt it was too much. And I remember just sitting in the car crying. I literally was just hysterically crying to him and I just couldn't explain it at all. I had actually made peace with the fact that this was just the way that it was. This was just the way that it goes. This was life, this was normal. And the moment that I actually became aware of my mental health was when I was 19, which in my mind is, is late considering it was constantly a battle up until that point. I was abroad traveling with my mum for a month. In this one moment, it all just, it's like it just boiled over. I, I was defeated by it in this moment and I was just hysterically crying. In that moment, I remember being in the hotel room with my mum and I tried to just explain it. And it was the first time that I explained every little detail about the smallest, most menial daily tasks. And then I explained what happens in my head behind that. And I will never forget that moment when my mom was just sitting there listening to me and just crying. I just remember her saying to me, this isn't normal. That was the moment that my life changed, that exact moment, I realised that I didn't have to fight this fight. It wasn't something that I had to deal with for the rest of my life, it was something that I, I could control and I could change. I just remember then and there getting my phone up and I started researching it and I remember reading up about anxiety and being like, oh my God, this is it, this is it. Like, this is a label, this is the label. This is a term to describe everything that I have been trying to describe and explain since I was so young and it's written here in front of me and it's summarized everything I have been trying to explain. It's like my whole life spun 180 and everything that I thought was real wasn't. And it was like having to retrain my brain from the start, from everything I had known. And that was a crucial moment because that was when I would say my mental health journey started. My awareness regarding mental health started a long time ago. One incident in particular was very detrimental, very pivotal in my life. In the 80s, I used to be a police officer, a constable with the Metropolitan Police. And we got a call that a police car had been surrounded and they had started to shake the car. They basically overturned it. Uh, beat the police officers and they ran away, etc. Set fire to the police car. Cut a long story short, it basically erupted into a huge confrontation and a riot. Uh, there were several hundred of the rioters. We were sitting there like that and I was standing there in a, in a line with the shields across us with no further orders except stay there. Several hours, we were surrounded by <clears throat> people who were using furniture. They were throwing furniture at us. They were dismantling uh, bits of anything to use as battens to beat us over the heads with. They were using clubs, machetes, 
They were pelting us from with bricks from above on the walkways. We could do nothing. We were not allowed to actually arrest anybody. All we were doing was standing still. So they would grab the top of our uh, shields, pull them down, and the next person next to him would bash us over the heads with baseball bats. The petrol bombs were coming from the top. There were police officers who were bursting into flames. We faced with the situation where you are going through emotions which are unbelievable. You are thinking about frustration because you want somebody up there to make a decision to say, either walk away or start arresting people, do something, not just stand there. Because we were in the firing line. One of the police officers stumbled and fell because you're trying to reverse. People are trying to hit you. You're trying to reverse and there's rubble and there's bricks and there's furniture and everything. The poor man stumbled and fell. He was engulfed by an angry mob of rioters. He started to beat the crap out of him. The demand for police officers, he was plucked from his desk duties where he was. Officer Keith Blakelock, God rest his soul. We pushed and pushed, go through to him and pulled him back only to find that he had been killed with machetes. Now you're dealing with the situation where you're scared, you're petrified for your life. Ultimately, at five, six in the morning, several hours later, they ran out of ammunition. They ran out of anything to throw at us. There was nothing more to be achieved that set fire to shops, that set fire to houses, that set fire to cars, and done as much damage as they wanted to without any form of restriction on the police officers. Having seen that, if that happened today, every single one of the police officers present there on that day, we would guarantee today have one-to-one -one counseling for as long as it took. Today, you understand it. People understand it, recognize it, appreciate it, and sympathize with people. But in 1980s, how much of that did we get? Zero. I needed help. And when nothing was available from the authorities, from the police, from the social, whatever you want to call it, I turned and hoped that my partner, my life, my friends, I suppose, would be my next port of call. Because you can only lie in bed and think about it for so many times. It's difficult to get back to normal routine. After all that, we've seen a fellow officer butchered. I have never had any kind of help, therapy, advice, assistance, or anything. So in terms of my own journey with mental health, it's a pretty long journey with many different factors. But I guess one of the standout things, especially as a boy, was that I was a pretty sensitive kid. I used to cry a lot, but going through my teenage years, it became more and more apparent that being sensitive as a boy wasn't going to get me anywhere. I'd be ridiculed, I'd be deemed unattractive, and I'd quickly lose the respect of my peers. So over time, I kind of learned that it was better to turn off the way I feel and push through any challenges. In hindsight, this wasn't probably the best approach because I completely went the opposite way. I turned off all of my emotions and so much so that I distanced myself from my family so that I wouldn't get hurt by anyone and I lacked empathy in both my friendships and romantic relationships. It was like a switch that I had turned off and it felt pretty powerful at the time because I had this control and I convinced myself that nothing affects me. I guess I felt like a real man. But over time, I realized that this was just damaging all my relationships. I started to feel empty inside. So over the last five years or so, I've really tried to unpack these feelings in myself and become more self-aware. My 30th birthday was so emotional because everything that I ever thought could go wrong did. Literally, I had just gotten out of a relationship. We were supposed to get married. Deep down in my, in my heart, I knew that I needed to get out because it was 
physically abusive. I was emotionally drained. I was mentally drained. My mental health was down the drain because of this abuse. During that relationship is when my mental health really deteriorated and I became suicidal. Thank God, like, I never, like, I, thank God I got the, I got help when I did because there was some times when it was just so overpowering. But when you're depressed and you're in a dark place, it feels like you're there alone, you know, and you feel so alone. You could be surrounded in a room with people that love you, that care about you, that adore you and still feel so alone. Th that was when the suicidal thoughts, like th they became more intense. My uh, mental health journey began in the 50s and the 60s. The social environment I was brought up in um, had a very simplistic and narrow-minded way of dealing with anybody who had mental health issues. Sadly, an attempt was never made to see if there's any particular thing they could do, the society could do to help rectify the issue. You either learned how to deal with your, your problem or suppress it, ignore it, or learn to adjust. And failing to do that would run the risk of you becoming an outcast. That unfortunately was the way life was at that time. For me, I, I never really had any mental health problems or I never experienced poor mental health, very luckily. I've always been quite a chilled person. So I, I didn't, I never felt anxiety before until 2020 actually, where a number of bad things happened and I had anxiety for the first time. And um, it was kind of crippling to be honest. Got to the point where I actually went to see a therapist. I sat down for my first therapy session and I just burst into tears. Um, and I think I spent the entire 50 minutes just sobbing my way through while I was there. I was dealing with um, some grief and anxiety and I, a number of other things happened. So it was a big deal. And I kind of just realised um, that I wasn't able to manage it all on my own, which was a big deal for me because I kind of thought that I should have been. So my mental health journey, um, I, it's a long one. I think I was always a very sad, troubled child, I, sh I should say. Um, you know, when I was up until I was, you know, six years old, I was super happy. And then there was a switch in my brain and I became highly anxious, highly depressed. And my parents picked up on it, but I guess they didn't really know what to do when I was so young. And then I was diagnosed with depression, also pretty young. and. I went through a lot of self-harm and um, I've tried to commit several times and it was it was a tough time and I think especially after you know being in a position where I was being talked about a lot in the brown community from literally middle school all the way up until I graduated college I found it really difficult for me to find my self-worth or find my time to actually take care of myself like I wasn't being a functioning adult I was functioning in every other part of my life, you know, trying to excel in school, finding jobs, all of that came a lot better to me than taking care of myself. In terms of men my mental health journey, I would say that um, there wasn't one up until the pandemic, really. I was very much a person to just brushed off, off anything that upset me or anything that bothered me, um, any news I heard, any anything that happened in my life, my friend's life or whatever. It was always a case of just brushing it off and, and keep going. There wasn't much of a dealing with it as such even if I was sad I would just keep going and, and focus on the positive I'd always be able to see the positive in a situation um, and nothing would really tie me down and, and keep me at that down point up until the pandemic uh, that, that that's when I had all the time in the world to be down and nothing to distract myself with so that's where it all began really So the pandemic has really affected my mental health. Mentally, it's been hard because 
it's been a year now that's when i left my relationship and i moved somewhere and because of covid i had to face everything on my own when i mean everything i mean all my emotions good the good the negative i don't know like you know the stages through breakup gosh oh my goodness i felt like because of that my mental health deteriorated like it was so bad but i remember like one night you know i was just sitting to myself and i was just thinking you know i've got to keep going i've got to keep going i can't I know it's hard and I know it's painful, but I need to keep going. I've got good and bad, you know what I mean? The bad is I had to go through such a, a painful breakup um, on my own. But then on the other hand, it really made me stronger. I think just because in the back of my mind, I had the determination to keep going. I had already made up my mind that I'm not going to let this beat me. You know, I'm going to keep going. I have to pick myself back up. Um pandemic did affect my mental health because um i lost my job which wasn't fab um that was kind of where a lot of my anxiety came from but i i think it hasn't been great for young people not to be socializing and and uh, it has been hard not to see anybody uh, i had to move home because i lost my job and um luckily i have another job now but uh it was it's difficult um, not being able to see young people and talk to your friends and see them face to face. It's, um, I think it has been a damaging time. So for me, the pandemic was quite tough. I also broke up my girlfriend at the time. Um, I had the, the challenges that the pandemic brought and then I also had the breakup. And when you combine them together, it, it's not a good combo, I'll tell you that. Um, things were quite hard and everything was quite difficult. I wasn't in the best of places. Um, and I also had exams at the time, so my stress levels were literally up here. Um, so things were hard to say the least. The pandemic didn't really affect me as much. I was very fortunate that I had a job that allowed me to work from home. And, um, you know, I was in a safe environment. However, there was one point when the Black Lives Matter thing happened and the incident happened in America. And I found that I was very much in my phone and just looking, flicking between three different apps, uh, Instagram, Tumblr and Twitter and just reading what people are saying and watching people's response and the marches and the movements that are happening and seeing people, you know, being physically abusive, getting lost in all of that as a thing. It just, it got a bit much. I just remember for like a day I switched my phone off and I was just like, nope, I'm not doing it anymore. The pandemic faced me with a lot of things. I reached the lowest point that I had been in years. I noticed that old habits, old mental habits, unhealthy ones, which I had identified and addressed back when I was 19, came back full force. And honestly, I did not expect it. It was the first time when I actually realized firsthand that when it comes to your mental health, you don't find the areas that need attention, fix them, take it off your list and move on. And it was the first time I realized that this was gonna be regular maintenance. This was something that could come up and could continue to come up. And I just have to be in a position where I have control over it. And it was a really difficult reality to be faced with, to realize that things that I thought I had passed, I hadn't passed. I also had old trauma come back that I thought I had healed from completely from so many years ago. And it came back and it threw me, it threw me because I really thought that I had healed every aspect of that. And it was a sudden, an unexpected and an unforgiving reminder that I hadn't. I had a few emotional triggers come up in family and other aspects of my life. But through the process of having to navigate that, I also had the most concentrated period of growth that I have ever experienced in my life. And I can sit here in front of you now and say that that triggered the most incredible 
experience internally for myself and it's only what I can describe as a spiritual awakening. It has been truly the, the biggest and the best blessing that I've ever received. It's as if I have had a whole new fresh outlook and perspective on my life, what happens to me, what doesn't happen to me, the good, the bad, everything in between. It was like a complete internal cleanse. And I have all of those struggles that the pandemic gave me to thank for that gift. The recent pandemic definitely affected my mental health in both positive and negative ways, I'd say. There was, um, there was positive to come out of it. Like I was saying before, there's always a positive to come out of a certain situation. It's just all about the way you see it. And for me, originally, I couldn't see the positive out of any situation during a pandemic. But now I can see how I've grown and how it's benefited me. But at the beginning, there definitely, I couldn't see that at all. I'd say the pandemic taught me that happiness and a lot of things in this world is materialistic and unless you're happy within yourself then it's just a risk you know you need to be able to I, I put my happiness into a lot of things I had work happiness relationship happiness um, seeing my friends every you know all my distractions were basically my happiness and I think the pandemic taught me that unless you have happiness within yourself it's just a risk and that's where things can go wrong whatever your struggle is even if someone seems greater that doesn't mean that yours is worth any less or shouldn't be taken as seriously. Um, for me, my issue was, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like my friend just lost his uncle or my friend just been put in hospital and these were situations that was actually happening. Why should I be sad? Why is my situation, why should I be feeling sorry for myself or why am I down? Why should I allow this? Why should I be feeling sad? You know, why... I don't have the right to be feeling sad. Comparing your problems to someone else's is never gonna make you feel any better. Just because your situation doesn't seem as bad as theirs, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be taken as seriously. For me, it's routine, especially in the pandemic. When the chaos of, of my life exploding happened, the only thing that really got me through was the routine I established for myself, as well as seeing my therapist, obviously. But, um, you know, I was able to manage my anxiety a bit more because I knew what was happening at every point in the day. And I, if I was able to achieve those small goals within my day, so um, I, it felt like a win. And I also would say, most importantly of all, is talk to people, talk to your friends, talk to your family, um, even if you don't want, to, don't want to, like just telling one person how you're feeling, if you're feeling anxious or whatever, it can really, really help, or it really, really helped me anyway. I felt such an expectation to be fun, and I think by saying, look, I'm having a really hard time right now, it kind of it took away the expectation I placed on myself to be fun because I was like, well, then they know I'm, if they ask me to hang out, they know I'm having a hard time. So they know I'm not going to be fun or whatever. Um, I do think that's really helpful. The thing that I do to kind of keep in check and look after my mental health is journaling. And I don't really have the standard journal. I made my own self-development custom bullet journal, which I find to be super useful. And basically what this is, is I have it in front of me now so I can show you a few pages. Um, one of the pages being a habit tracker and this is so good to keep on track with with the things that you've got to do so one of mine here is to drink 2.5 litres of water daily to go to the gym every single day so it just allows you and provides you with that consistency to grow your habits so over time they you just see the results and it is really really good especially when you keep on top of it monthly and yeah that's kind of that's kind of my journal I have a bunch of other stuff in there but I think it's really important to to journal because it allows you to reflect on whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, on how you're feeling mentally um, and physically, um, which is really great. Okay, so for me, just literally the basics, I know you could eat the, the main ones are like exercise, eating healthy. Uh, for me, what has helped impact my mental health is literally just enjoying the finer little things every day. Like I say this to my friends all the time, they, they always say they're envious of me because I'm able to make a coffee, dance around in the kitchen, listen to the radio, and that's made me happy. Like, I don't need anything big to make my life happy. Like, I, I love success. I love, obviously, enjoying myself. I love partying. I love making money as much as anyone else. But 
I can literally be all right for the day, for the week, for the month, just by listening to some music, having a laugh with my mates, and just 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 having having a dance. I just love being around good vibes, and I think that's more important than anything when it comes to mental health and healing your pain and taking your taking your mind away from any kind of stress that might be sitting in the back of your head. Uh, one thing that I do for my mental health is try and have a good relationship with my brain. Now, to me, mental health has become a buzzword that has become you know, very popular over the last 10 years or so. And I find that um, when people are speaking about mental health, they talk about everything else but the brain. <clears throat> Forgetting that the brain is the epicenter of everything, thoughts, emotions, conversations, uh, physical, mental, if I asked you to wiggle your little toe, it would be from the brain. The brain sends that message. An example that I use is there's a car driving down the street and it turns left. What made the car turn left? The wheels, obviously the wheels make a car turn. Is that okay, but how did the wheels turn? That, okay, the steering wheel. So the steering wheel turned the wheels, which turned the car. The hands on the steering wheel turned the wheels, which turned the car. And it's like, okay, it was the, it was the driver. And it's like, no, it wasn't the driver, it was the brain. The brain made the car turn left. And it's a difficult thing to grasp, but the reason why that example is important to me is because it shows the amount of layers that get put in front of stuff before you get to the reason why most things happen, which is because the brain and the mind is not in alignment or is not balanced. That's why I try and have a good relationship with my brain so that I can restore that balance when I see that it's going one way or the other. Our brains are built for survival and in most situations, it's looking at something and saying, is this a threat or am I safe? And the, the issue that I find is that the brain still keeps that same method in everything, in every scenario you're in, where, whether you're with your family, with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, by yourself in your car, picking your kid up from nursery or whatever it is, you're on a computer, your brain is trying to perceive everything as a threat or not. And that's a lot of the reason why we end up in conflicts and why there's fights and why there's arguments and why there's wars is because our brain is just trying to perceive everything as a threat, like, am I gonna die? And even though some things aren't that extreme, your brain may take the same measures to protect itself as it would do in those scenarios. So for me, self-care looks like being accountable of my actions and consistently checking myself. Like, am I being the best version of myself? And if not, it's okay, but why am I not being that best version? Is it because of something that's underlying or is it because of my immediate situation that's not allowing me to do that? And I really try to analyze the situation in, in a healthy manner where I'm not overthinking. Um, everything comes with a balance, but I really try to analyze and understand exactly why I'm acting the way I'm acting. Why are my emotions taking, you know, heed over my, over my actions? Normalize your problems. Talk about it openly. Don't be shook to talk about it or, or make it something you've got to hide. That was something I was doing. I just, uh, if you spoke to me during the pandemic, you would have thought I was completely fine. I was uh, the king. It's like, I could have probably won a casino game at that point because I could have fooled everyone. Anyone who spoke to me, yeah, bro, we say, and you're cool, everything like that. But as soon as I hung up the phone, it was back to being mash up and just laying on my bed, no motivation. It was peak. Um, but I normalized it. I started speaking to everyone just about how I was. That I wasn't all right. I was actually not doing too well. And... Um, Saying that type of stuff during the pandemic, everyone understood. And I think that was definitely a point where people were more understanding towards that whole subject. Don't make it a big thing. Don't be something, don't make it something to run from. If you're down, you're down. That's it. It comes down to you. You need to be able to figure out what makes you happy, what makes you relaxed. Find that peace. If it's seeing friends, if it's getting back into stuff that you used to do, or even if it's like basic things like trying to fix up your room. For me, my bedroom was making me, because we'd just moved into this new house, the bedroom was just making me feel depressed. It wasn't my home. Um, so, it's getting there. It's getting there. It's a work in progress, but the room's getting there. Drinking. <laughs> Drinking in efforts to run away from how you're feeling at the time. Because we think, oh, if I drink, I'm going to forget. No, <laughs> I learned that the hard way. Drink 
like heightens everything oh my goodness all those negative feelings you were drink you were having before you were drinking and then you drink those negative feelings are like amplified don't use alcohol as a way of coping it may make you feel good maybe for an hour or two or three hours or whatever but i guarantee you it'll just make you fall way back like where you were so if you were in the bottom of the pit right you will go through that pit i think there's quite a few activities that encourage bad mental health and um, one of the biggest things is just i guess the mindset of people and how they care what people think and this i just believe is like it's your life and you don't need to care or concern yourself with other people's opinions to some extent and then adjust yourself accordingly. They should not have a bearing on how and what you do in your life. It's completely up to you. I think surrounding yourself with toxic people is one of the worst things you can do. It sounds easier said than done, right? Because you think, oh, if I was around toxic people, I'd clock that I'm around toxic people, but it doesn't work that way. It's like that saying goes, you're a product of the five people you hang around with. And it's so true because mindset is everything nowadays. And you want to be hanging around with people who have similar mindsets to you and have similar ambitions to you and whatever it is, because otherwise you're going to, whether you like it or not, fall into bad habits, patterns, whatever it may be. So I think surrounding yourself around positive, like-minded people is so important. I do think that sometimes television and film can be damaging in that often it's not handled well. I think it's so important if you're portraying a story where someone is suffering from mental health, bad mental health, that you get it right and that you handle it in the right way and that you put all the appropriate trigger warnings. I would stress that so much. Like don't watch something. If you have if your feet if you are depressed or have anxiety, um, don't watch something where someone is suffering from depression or anxiety. I found it quite difficult myself to watch. Okay, social media obviously is a big talking point because I think it's a platform that allows people to use the tool in a wrong way. Don't get me wrong, it's great. You can express yourself, you you can uh, promote your projects, you know, start businesses, but it's overly abused in the wrong way, uh, especially in the younger millennial generation. Like people are just envious of fake lifestyles. People are projecting toxic images of cultures and their personalities and highlighting a reel of their, of a false interpretation of how they're actually living and the money they're making and the, the, the lifestyle they're living and the culture they're breeding. And it's just, making unreal expectations for young people to live up to in terms of their wealth, success, happiness, and they're falling into a trap, a vicious cycle of trying to live up to something that doesn't even exist and comparing themselves to people who aren't even being true or to, to the living their reality. It's, it's, it's all mad. So I definitely think mental health, just detach away from anything that's making you feel bad. And it's really hard to do that because no one ever says this. The thing with social media is that you can't detach from it because you think you have to be in it. You think you have to compete. You have to make your life look like that, but you actually don't. There's plenty of happy people not on social media living their life actually the way you're supposed to. It's the people who are like slaves to social media who are trapped and they're unhappy and it creates this negative uh, mental health issues. I think comparing yourself to other people in every capacity. It could be salary, it could be what job you carry, what position you have, what school you're going to, what GPA you have, what kind of parents do you have? You know, I think a lot of times we get jealous when certain people have closer relationships with their families or closer relationships with their siblings or, you know, someone looks like they have a really great group of friends. Like a lot of it's like, why don't I have that? And I think comparing yourself in every means is negative because you know, you are the only person who knows your reality. Only you know what you need. And so when we're comparing ourselves to someone else, you know, they might have a whole set of different criteria. And, you know, when we compare and we constantly evaluate other people's lives, we divert attention from our own. And that can be the most unhealthy thing. I think what I've found is that participating in things that don't really align with what I truly value or enjoy. And you really have to get to know yourself and understand what you want from your life, not what the people around you deem as successful or a great life or what you think is a great life. We haven't experienced all these things, right? So a lot of us haven't experienced having a million pounds in the bank or things like that. So we yearn after it thinking that it's gonna solve things, but really and truly once that happens, 
it doesn't because what comes then is just more problems. You're always going to have problems. I mean, social media can definitely manipulate us and skew our perception of reality saying I'll be happy when or when this happens, then I'll finally be able to be more positive. But really and truly, if you can't be positive now, there's no saying that you're going to be positive then because there's always going to be something that you're going to be lacking in your life. If your mental health is down and you're feeling sad, I would really try to stay away from anything like alcohol or weed or anything like that. Anything that's just gonna play with your thoughts, you really need to just be aware of your thoughts and realize that they might be a bit negative, but don't let that temporary mindset drain you and bring you down. That was something that I, I had to stay on top of. Um, one is that I think overall uh, there has to be education via awareness of the real, the reality of how men are struggling. Generally people are not aware and maybe they should be told is the statistics of the amount of cases where men are registered as having mental health issues. The, the rate of suicide rate amongst men statistics of the amount of domestic violence aimed at the man. Now, with that, I think you'll shake that pedestal that people or society have put man on. I believe that type of conversation has to start with families and friends and people that you're close with, because that's what they're there for and that's what you're there for, for them, is to be able to have these conversations. I think the other thing is, as well as being the one who is speaking, you also have to be a good listener and be able to accept that someone may want to speak to you about something and you may not have the advice, but just let them talk. Let them talk, let them get it off their chest, let them say what they need to say and don't always go for the, the reaction response, which is, you know, F them, F everybody. I mean, yeah, just you don't need no one. It's like sometimes it's a case of trying to have a logical approach to things. Because once you've hung up that phone call, or you've walked away from that conversation, you go on with your life and that person still has to live with those things. So if they take your advice and it doesn't work and they come back to you, you're like, well, yeah, well, I don't know. It's just, I'm just saying what I felt, innit? But it's not necessarily right for them. And also just make yourself available. Like tell your boys, tell your nephews, your brothers, your uncles, your dad, your work colleague, you know, let them know that you can be there and you're available to talk. Sometimes that's enough, just knowing that someone has said that and they may not necessarily call you and say, hey man, I need to talk, but just that idea that there is someone there to speak to should it happen and you don't need to force conversations, but let them feel safe enough. Sometimes just let silence ride out. You know, often people just need someone to feel safe around and know that they can be safe somewhere. And if they get around you and they don't want to talk, cool chat crap, just chat about something else. Like it's not necessarily, you always have to speak about the issue and go into it and try and find stuff, try and limit your um, your personal anecdotes as well. And try not to make it about you, try not to switch it so that it's like, yeah, it's just like me, you know, and all of a sudden the conversation's veered off and it's, you're speaking about yourself. And never, one of my things is never use it against someone. You should never ever say, you know, you know, I was there for them when they needed me and all of that stuff, I feel like that's that undoes everything that you may have done and never you know, make them feel like you've done them a favour. If you're there for someone, be there for them genuinely and honestly and give them your time because you're, you're, not, you're not getting that time back anyway. So just be there in an honest way. I definitely think more can be done for men's mental health um, because there are plenty of men who are not comfortable speaking out for fear of being a failure, letting someone down or just generally being a burden. Um, I've definitely felt all these things in the past, which has stopped me from speaking out. But I think um, more can be done to actually educate parents on mental health. I think that's a big thing so that they can improve their understanding of their own kids when these issues arise. And also having more people in positions of influence speak out about their struggles and their journey to show people that it's normal. And it also gives people someone to relate to. But there are a lot of other factors that go into it. So I can't really give a definitive answer there. It's a culmination of so many different things and it's one of those things that generation after generation, hopefully we do end up getting better at it. Exactly what I'm doing now. I think people need to just get on this bandwagon of speaking about it, normalizing it, showing that it happens to everyone and just showing that it's all right to be down. God damn. I think that men do suffer from it uh, more silently. I'm not gonna say more. Uh, women are more expressive, I feel, emotionally. So they're more able to connect with other 
women and talk about their feelings and they're okay with it you know they're kind of not expected but they're kind of known to be emotional so you know people are more receptive to them talking about their feelings and when they're upset and they're angry and understand where they're coming from whereas men it's all like oh no you're weak you're seen as weak and you're you're seen as inferior you're seen as not an alpha dominant male whatever man it's like all the bad negative things that come with it if you express yourself or talk about being unwell or you feel like you're not good enough compared to another man or you feel like you're you know you have insecurities and that is so bad because again it's so toxic to portray masculinity in a certain way and guys are branding themselves on how men should look act feel and it's just it's just really creating a massive disconnect in men and it's really sad to see and i'm really grateful and proud and happy to be able to express myself. I don't care if I look a bit emotional or sensitive or, you know, like some guys might think us a bit feminine. Like I'm okay, like I know myself, do you know what I mean? Like I know my sexuality, I know myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So the second I realized that and stopped caring about what others perceive me as not as masculine or, you know, is this too feminine? I I've just been living my truth and it's, if anything, attracted more good things into my life. I've connected with more women from being this way. I've um, I've inspired other men to be more open with me about their feelings and then we become better mates. And yeah, that's, that's honestly the only advice that I could give from the top of my head to men. Just be more open with yourself. Even if you feel uncomfortable, you push past those boundaries. And from being the one to do that, you will be the one to lead others and open the door to let them see that it's okay to say and do certain things for the way you live your life. I, I don't have a specific ones. I've got like loads of little ones. But I think something that's really gotten me through was just taking the time to appreciate who I am, appreciate what I've been through, appreciate where I've come from. Like really taking the time to say, wow, you know, look in the mirror and just say like, <laughs> I've been through some shit, but I'm still here. You know, I think more than anything, that's something that's really pushed me forward. And something that's actually kept me going. And the love that I have for myself kept me going. 100%. You know, like I said before, sometimes when you're really going through it, you could be surrounded by so many people that love you and still feel so alone and feel like nobody cares. But it's that love that you need to have for yourself that will keep you going. It will, I promise you. Nobody will love you like you love you. You are the only person that is with you when you are crying in the middle of the night. You are the only person that you're with you when you're in the trenches, when you're in that dark pit. And nobody else can get you out. It's you and you alone. You might feel like you don't have love for yourself. But trust me, you do. You do. Just haven't realized it yet. The pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. And the realist adjusts its sails. This quote, I think, is super powerful. I think it, especially relating to mental health, I think it just shows how you can literally it's all up to you in the end of the day and you can stand there and complain and you can also stand there and do nothing but if you take control you'll see um, see how far you can actually go. My favourite piece of advice would be to live in the in today. I try I think being present in your life is has been the most helpful thing for me i was always thinking oh my like oh my god i'm not where i should be or what am i gonna be doing in two years i really need to be here in two years like no just live in today you need to focus on today the best piece of advice that i got when dealing with my mental health was understanding that your thoughts create your reality your life is based on what you believe is true and you are in control of what you want. And if you choose to see love and if you choose to see happiness, then that is what you will attract. And when I realized that and really internalized that, my entire worldview changed and everything that I was grateful for just illuminated so brightly in my eyes. 
And so the moment I realized that our thoughts create our reality in a very literal sense, that's when my entire worldview changed and that's when my whole life changed. And it's, it's not like, you know, everything's perfect now, but it's that because not everything is perfect, I see how beautiful life is and that it really is a roller coaster. Life is not beautiful, life is not the worst, life doesn't suck, life isn't happy. It's right down the middle. And that's what's beautiful, is that, that gray middle ground that we all live in. So my favorite quote is, take control of your mind. It sounds simple, but it's a concept which is extremely difficult to implement. I first read that quote in uh, the book The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle when I was at a very low point. I was at the point of a, a breakup with my partner at the time and the way that it affected my mental health was something that I'd just never experienced before and it was one of the, the lowest low points I had reached. And I think that this quote is so important because it highlights the fact that your mind is a separate entity entirely to yourself. There's your brain and there's you. You can control your mind. You're not working with your mind. A lot of the time your mind is working against you. You're separate. It's not a part of you. It's a separate part of you. And sometimes you need to be the one to control that mind. Delusion is only delusional when you don't accomplish the goals of making your delusion a reality. For me, that was um, a quote that stood out to me, especially when I was at a weak point. Anything you want to do is achievable. You just got to do it. The mind is so powerful. You know, it's just about finding the right perspective on things and um, going out there and making it happen. So whatever place you're in, you can get yourself out. It's just about finding the right perspective on it and really looking after yourself and being true to yourself and, and figuring out what it is that's got you in a place you're at and what you can and can't do to get yourself out and when I say that I mean some things are in your control and some things aren't and the things that aren't in your control you've got to put it into perspective of how it's going to affect you it's okay to be sad for a while just try to get yourself out of that point out of that place um, you've got to try and find a way and it, and it comes down to you as a person and understanding yourself I say the key is always to understand yourself you've got to be able to realize why how put it all together I can't put it into a video and give you the tutorial because only you know you everyone is different everyone is their own person you have to be able to figure out yourself and understand why you're in this place and how can you get yourself out I want to say that it gets better that's a fact like no matter what it does get better as long as you're keeping a positive mindset and putting the effort in as much as you can it will get better i promise you that and for me it comes down to three things right it's consistency discipline and timing um and what i mean by that is having the consistency to be on it with whether it, for me it's my habits every single day being disciplined to do it even if you don't want to do it timing what i mean by that is it's not going to happen you're going to see results in a month two months three months it may take a year and that's okay what would i say to anyone who's struggling with mental health right now Please, 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 please talk to somebody. Please, please, please talk to somebody. Please do not um, demean what you're feeling. Don't think that it's silly. Don't think that you're gonna get through it on your own. I'm sure you can, but I promise you it's 100% easier if you don't try and you just speak to somebody and you share the problem and you you get help, like honestly, and accept the help that is offered to you, please. What would I say to someone struggling? I would say you're not alone. And as much as you might not feel it, there are plenty of people willing to help you. But the first step is just asking for it. I struggle with this personally in my own life and I know plenty of men who do. But if there's one message that I would share is that there's no shame in asking for help. If I had a message to anyone who was watching who's struggling with mental health right now, I would definitely say reach out to people. There's a lot of friendly people online. I know that sounds weird, but that's definitely something that helped me. I would say reach out to someone, reach out to the people you're cool with, reach out to your loved ones. And when you're just chatting, if they ask how you are, just be honest about it. They might drop you advice. They might even start checking in on you. And that's the thing, you're not alone in this. A lot of people have your back. Don't be alone. Don't be feeling like you can't talk to anyone about it. I know it's awkward, but trust me, opening up helps. If you listen carefully, there are two voices in your head right now. Um, there's you, and then there's what I call like your advisor. 
maybe at this moment one is speaking louder than the other one is speaking more than the other one and it's making you anxious it's making you feel like you're not good enough or it's making you feel like things are hard and don't get me wrong things around you may not be great but it doesn't mean that the situations that you cannot get out of just notice how that voice is speaking and repeating certain scenarios and feeding in as it's going around you know oh that person didn't say hello to you, that person didn't say hello to you, that person didn't say hello to you. It's probably because they don't like you, that person didn't say hello to you. Probably because they don't like you and you're ugly. And all of a sudden it's adding in these extra bits, extra bits, extra bits every time before you know it, you're in this cyclone of like, nobody likes me and, and everything's wrong and I'm not good enough and, and how your self-worth you know, starts to diminish and you sort of realise that that voice now has the control. I suppose try and understand that there is an internal battle and conflict that is going on and you're not alone in this world and there are many people who are going through the same thing and I don't say that to mean that you're just a drop in the ocean what I mean is that we all don't know what is going to happen from one second to the next in order to free yourself from the mental prism that you've probably put yourself in you kind of have to make your brain aware of itself and when you do that in whichever way it is you should find that there are no bars there are no doors there are no windows, no buildings, there's nothing holding you back internally and hopefully you'll find some sort of freedom and some sort of peace and I wish that for everybody. A lot of people say, you know, talk to someone when you're struggling with your mental health and I do agree that it's really important to seek out help whether it's in your community or with a therapist but it's really hard to do that and so the one thing that I would like to say is that your situation is unique to you and, you know, not everyone can understand. Not everyone will. And it's okay that, you know, it's, it's hard. It's okay if you feel alone. And every time someone said, go get help, I would feel frustrated because I wouldn't know where. I wouldn't know how. I wasn't allowed to. I was 15 in an Indian household. I wasn't allowed to get help. And so when I decided that I'm okay, I'm okay, that's what changed my mind that I need help and that I could get it on my own. So first know that you're gonna be okay. You actually are. As much as we want to think that everything happens to us, it happens for us. You know, I can sit here at 23 and say, and tell my 16 year old self, hey, everything happens for us, not to us. But that's not gonna register. You know, we have to think about first knowing that you are gonna be okay. If I really wanna to talk to someone about anything, it would be to my 16 year old self and tell her that she's gonna be okay. Reach out. If you're going through something and you can't find a way out of it and you feel like there is nobody that can help you and there's nobody that can understand, reach out. You know, one thing I was always told is reach out to anybody, but no. I, I don't think that's good advice because you could reach out to somebody and they can make you feel and they could literally be that thing that just tips you over the edge. You know what I'm saying? You, you constantly feel like you're alone when you're going through something, but you're not. You're not. I celebrate you. To everybody out there that's really been struggling with their mental health, every day that you that you make it through, I celebrate you. All your little wins, I celebrate you. I do. Can we just please, 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 guys, let's, let's do better. Let's do more in making sure that the people that are around us are okay. I've had to deal with it myself. And all I can tell you is that I, I survived it. And today, you can survive it. But you don't have to do it alone. You got plenty of helping hands and opportunities. You got you got help from all over. So I hope none of you have to actually go through and and have to look after yourself to the extent that I've had to. All I can say is good luck. You can do it. Humans are strong, resilient. Don't give in to it. Stay strong. Stay focused. And most of all, share whatever you feel with your loved ones. 
and eventually there's always professional help. I hope that this has shown you that there is an entire community of people supporting you, loving you, encouraging you and holding your hand. I hope that everyone's stories, their pain, their struggles has helped give you a sense of motivation to keep going, comfort to know that it's not just you and a sense of knowing that you deserve better and you can get better. And sometimes when it feels like in your immediate circle, it's just you experiencing this, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there is a huge community of people that are experiencing what you're experiencing, but they're just outside of your circle. So I hope that you feel so much love through the screen right now from everyone that took part in this because everyone here is sending you so much love. Keep smiling, stay safe. Thank you guys so much for watching and for listening to what we have to say. I love you guys and I will see you next time. Mwah. Bye guys. Pisses you off. <laughs> Devi, is that gonna be edited out? Anyway, yeah, so things like that. Yeah, you like that Devi? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I don't know how you do this. This is hard. This is so hard. Oh.